Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Little Beach Podcast. I am Ramon Mejia. This is episode number 96 of the podcast. Um, I'm here to bring you the Little Beach news, reviews, and of course author interviews. And this week I have seven new lit RPG titles to review for you folks at home. And that's going to include The Clan Wars um, with the Shaman Book 7. This is the last book in the Way the Shaman series. It'll be a tearful goodbye, uh, but some very interesting um, comments on it. Um, also out for review is going to be the Seventh Talon Book 1, Dragon Rider Fury. Uh, then also Respawn, Lives 1 through 5 by Arthur Stone, same author of the uh, Weirdest Snoop series. Uh, also Sakura Online, The Ringer. And then it lowers beginning, a lit RPG game lit epic. Uh, and then after that will be Rogue Online, The Devil's Gate. And then last, it's going to be The Grind. Okay, but of course we begin the show though with Lit RPG News. And in Little Bitty News, we're going to begin with um, a very, well, to me, it's a very fun story. Um, Jeffrey Falcon Logan, author of the Slime Dinner Chronicles, is making a video game based on this story. Um, it's very much in the development stages, but it's really fun and exciting to see somebody who's in our community, who's a writer, uh, who, who makes a pretty good, you know, um, wage on that. But then he's also expanding it beyond that uh, into video games. Even this is this is a 2D stride scroller, and you can tell, like, it's very... Um, school project dish, but it's still kind of fun to look at and see. And I'll pull it up uh, for you guys to, to watch it. Just kind of see it in the corner there. Um, but definitely um, very interesting to look at. Let's see if I can pull it a little bit bigger. Maybe that's a little more useful. Maybe it isn't. I don't know. But still, um, very fun project. Definitely love looking at it. Uh, I'm like makes me so happy for some reason to see a side scroller based on any little RPG uh, property. So there you go. Uh, also in some more fun stuff, just in the community, um, Charles Dean, uh, he's a little bit author of the wave Returnus, uh, the bathrobe night. And I forget the other series, but he has another one in the same bathrobe night, um, universe. Um, he is trying to do a YouTube thing, um, where he drinks, and talks to authors he likes, or just people he likes. It's called Drinking with Charles. Uh, and uh, for his first episode, he had himself, he had Jeff Hayes, and he had Blaze Corbin. And they were all drinking very heavily uh, and making some very fun statements and goofing around and talking about the genre and Little Bridgie author stuff and a bunch of other things. They all kind of got really drunk, and it was highly entertaining. I totally encourage you to go watch it and to laugh uh, at it. Uh, I have a link in the show notes for the YouTube page. And for that particular one, it was done through uh, Jeff Hayes' um, Sound Booth Theater YouTube page. Um, but Charles Dean is also trying to just going to create his own YouTube channel for this specifically and for some of the other kind that he wishes to do. He also has another one, again, through Jeff Hayes' channel um, with Harmon Cooper. That just happened a little more recently. So definitely go check those out. Uh, but the one Blaze was very... Super, super funny. I can't recommend it enough to read, uh, to, to watch, I should say. Okay, uh, now this is an announcement from this podcast, actually. Uh, we don't do a lot of promotional things, but because our 100th episode is coming up and it's kind of a milestone for us, um, I decided to kind of throw a contest together uh, to just kind of reward the viewers, reward listeners, and, you know, create a little bit of promotion around the fact that we hit 100 episodes or that we're going to hit 100 episodes. It's kind of exciting. We're doing like this, we're this giveaway. Um, here are the ways that you can enter to win. You can actually do multiple entries, and you get basically more more chances to win uh, the prize, the fabulous prizes that will be I'll be giving out. Um, you can ways to enter basically uh, sign up for our Little Bridgie Podcast newsletter. I know you probably didn't know we had one. Most people don't. Um, it's the th- it, I basically just send out the show notes for the podcast every week, uh, but it includes like the list of the upcoming Little G, um, stuff that came out this week, and of course, our reviews. Uh, so if you're not into, if you, or if you can't um, watch it or listen to it, and you, but you still want the information every week, this is kind of the way that I get that out there. Um, and it can, you know, all the same things you're, you're seeing now in the show notes are kind of just sent to you on a weekly basis. Um, but again, it's once a week. And you don't get anything else from us, like ads or anything. So, um, but I thought, okay, you know, we have a thing. People kind of like it, um, so we'll make that one way to enter. Because of course, we can also get your email information too, so we can contact you if you win. That, that's an important part of this whole process: being able to contact you. Um, another way you can enter is to like our Facebook, our Twitter, or our YouTube pages. Um, 
you know, just simply follow us or like us. And that's a very easy way to get an entry into our particular contest and giveaway. Um, I'll have a link for all those in you know, all those places in the show notes, of course. Um, and of course, last, um, but this is kind of the fun one for me, at least, um, send us an email. Send us a, make a post on our Twitter, uh, Twitter and Facebook page or YouTube page about um, your favorite Lit RPG podcast episode or story or event or review or news story or whatever else it is, um, or just like something about the podcast that you like and you enjoy. Uh, I, I actually plan to take those particular entries and read them on the air between you know now and or, or by episode 100 as a kind of way of saying, um, you know, just to say and, and respond to like, oh, these are the people, things that people like about the show, these are their favorite moments. Maybe I'll do like a little, um, what are they called? Flashback uh, to that particular thing. Um, you never know. Um, but these are also just ways to have a fun time with you guys who are the listeners and the watchers. Um, and again, each one of those ways, each one of those things that you do can get you an entry into like a, a chance to win. Now, some of the prizes you can win um, include audible codes. An ebook from either myself or another liberty author. We have a couple of people who have donated their their products, um, including Alaron Kong, um, David Wilmarth, um, some other people as well. Um, and as more people decide to participate in this or not, or just kind of give things away, I'll add more names to the list, of course. Um, you can also win signed print editions of, of some physical copies, like my I have physical copies of Project Alpha, Adventures on Terra, and I'll be more than happy to sign those and actually mail them to you. If you live in the United States um, or you know Canada, somewhere I can mail it to you and it's not international, that's super expensive. So, um, But there are some other things I'd be more than happy to send out to international people, including like Audible codes, um, if they work for you. I think there are differences between them. Um, but eBooks, definitely shippable that way um, but also the big grand prize is going to be a 100 dollar amazon gift card which will be announced as like the big prize um on episode 100 but of course between now and then uh for episode number 96 and 97 98 99 and 100 i'll be giving away stuff every single week on the podcast as a way to kind of celebrate again the fact that we're going to hit episode 100 oh yeah uh, at some point uh so that's that's it for a little bit of news uh Hopefully, you guys will be willing to participate in this, and we'll have this nice big um, thing. So there you go. Uh, okay, these are some stories that are out now, but I haven't reviewed, but they are out currently. Uh, this includes Harmon Cooper's Fantasy Online. I think I believe this is the third novel in that series. Uh, we also have Halicon Rising, Bastion of Hope, Book Two. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to review it. Depends on the schedule. I wasn't super impressed the last time, but um, we'll see how that goes. Um, the Trash Tier Dungeon is also out, written by Kay Fairburn. Uh, she's written a, another little bit of story previously, so this is her second entry into the, the genre. Um, and Fragged 8 is out. I won't be reviewing that one. Kind of dropped the series because it stopped being Little Bridget and just stopped being entertaining for me. It's also a short story series, so uh, I'm sure the author plans to put them together. But if you're into that series, number 8 is out currently. So there we go. Um, now, uh, new audiobooks. There are quite a few new audiobook Little Bridget's out um, this week, including World Keeper, Donna Venera, Book 2 in that series, uh, Paternia Online, Book 2, uh, Desert Born, narrated by Andrea Parsonu, written by um, Don Chapman, is out now. Uh, also, the audiobook for Life in the North. That's a really um, popular Little Bridget title. It's a post-apocalyptic future with game mechanics and survival stuff and, you know, hordes of monsters. Um, it is out as an audiobook as well. Uh, as is Continue Online Part 4, Crash, written by Seven More, uh, Seven Morse, rather, from the podcast. Um, and it is narrated by Pavi Provoskio. There you go. And those are all audiobooks that are out currently for you guys to enjoy and to listen to. Uh, I'll drop some links in the show notes for the reviews for the ebooks versions of all those things. So in case you forgot what they were or you never had a chance to read the ebook, uh, you can get a sense of like whether it might be for you or not. But I guess, of course, as, as always, because they're audiobooks, there's also a special component of the narrator's voice. Uh, so I always encourage you to go listen to the sample uh, before you purchase, just in case the narrator's voice doesn't really mesh with your ear muscles or your 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 auditory senses. Okay, um, upcoming Little BD. This is where I read off the new stuff that I know that's coming in the future. Um, you can skip it if you want to, but there are uh, quite a few new entries in this particular list, including Immortal... Kalika, episode one, uh, written by the author uh, Belrart Wright. There we go. Uh, also new on the list is The Lionheart, a Liberty novel. No Respawn book number one. 
um, of Kingdom Level 4 is still scheduled for February the 28th, and I forget to read those dates. I think I did. Um, Lionheart is out on February 27th. Um, Immortal Kalika is out on February the 16th, so just upcoming on this Friday. Uh, Kingdom Hearts Level 4 on February 28th. On February 28th as well, it's going to be Dragon Seed, a Liberty Dragon Rider adventure. On the 20th of February as well, a lot of books scheduled for the 28th of February. Um, Avatars Rising, Silos number one. Uh, also on February the 28th is going to be Dual Reality 2071. Uh, on March the 6th is going to be Restart, the Dark Paladin book number three. Uh, new to the list is going to be on March. Sorry, this is an item that is new to the list. It is called Outpost, a little RPG adventure in the Maces, Monsters, and Magic book series. Uh, out on March the 7th. Uh, Sakura Online um, is going to be out on March the 9th. This is book one in the series called The Sorting. Um, the, the are reviewing on the podcast Book Zero, which the author says is supposed to be a kind of prequel into the series um, and doesn't have potentially the same main character as, as book one. Um, so that's a it's kind of a different, but in the same kind of universe. Um, it also out on March the 15th is going to be Permadeath Online, book number two, and Don Chapman's A Killer Ry- Kill- Killer's Rain rather, is going to be out on March the 16th. And again, new to the list is going to be Ghost in the Game by Christopher Knee, out on March the 19th, I believe. That's still correct. I'll double check. Okay, uh, that's it for the new releases and reviews. I'm sorry, that's for uh, up, upcoming Lit RPG. On to new releases and reviews. <laughs> And in new releases and reviews, we have our first book, which is going to be Wave the Shaman, book number seven, uh, The Clans, Clans War. There we go. Uh, written by Vasily Mahenko. Okay, this one is 341 pages, $5.99. It is not available on Kindle Unlimited. Um, so um, you might... This, you might question whether or not you need to, to read this or not. Um, I'd say if you're a fan of the series and you didn't like how book six ended, definitely pick up. Uh, this is this is this is a lot more fulfilling. It has a lot more um, conclusion for a lot of the quest lines. Um, but if you liked the way and uh, book six ended, like you were really satisfied with that, you don't really have to pick this up. Um, basically, books one through six, book six does a decent enough job of ending the series. That's a pretty good ending. Um, but um, if you just want a little more adventure, go, go get it. It's, you know, I don't know that you're probably going to, you're, you're probably not going to regret it. Okay. Um, the author's, uh, description not long ago, Daniel, Mah- Daniel Mahan, known to everyone as the shaman Mahan thought that he had taken his sixth and final step in the Bar- Barilona game world. Yet life has other ideas. Uh, the corporation decides to re- resurrect the Lord of Shadow and his entire host. The corporation CEO personally pushes the reset button. Garenika and his Dragon of Shadow spring back to life as, meanwhile, the corporation makes an offer to offer the shaman can't refuse. Okay, that's um, basically like the first 5% of the novel is that section of it. It's just a real quick recap saying, oh, reset. Uh, the cor- that's what the corporation decided to do to kind of justify another story in the series. Um, remember that I in- once interviewed uh, Vasily Mahenko and he said he-, he originally had his series planned for like, I think it was four or five books. Um, and then he remembered he had a contract that said he had to write seven. So he kind of had to stretch it and also add more material to fulfill that seven book contract. Um, And this book is definitely, uh, it has a feel of like, oh, almost like an add-on. Like book six felt like a good ending of, um, like it felt like the end of your, the, the RPG game that you bought out of the store. Book seven feels like the DLC campaign that you could download later to expand that story and also give you some more time to adventure with your favorite characters. And that's what this feels like in a lot of ways. Um, This is the final novel in the way of the Shaman series, but of course, according to the author and the company that publishes in English, they said there are going to be more stories set in this world, but not necessarily with Mahan as the main character. He may make guest appearances and you'll see other characters, but the way the Shaman series is done, it's finished. It's been finished for quite a few years for the author um, as far as when he originally wrote it. So remember, we're just getting the English translations of it. Um, this novel, however, is a roller coaster ride, a plot twist, story development, um, and like I said, it, it feels more like the DLC you'd buy the after finishing the original storyline for for an RPG kind of game. Um, the, it there are just it, it does a really 
interesting job of like trying to finish off as many storylines from the series as possible, but it also does a lot of new stuff. And there, I mean, there are legitimately a lot, so many plot twists and so many new things that kind of pop out at you that the, 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 the reveal of like, Oh, an invasion from a rival con- continent is coming. And that's like the smallest storyline in the entire thing um i don't want to spoil anything for you but it's i had a good time with it um but again it it does feel a little bit like oh the author was is it's just kind trying to have a good time like there were fewer justifiable reasons for these twists uh, than there were in the past in australia it's just like the author's like oh this is my last hurrah i'm gonna make this good even if it doesn't always make like 100 percent sense it's still rather entertaining um so for me, I had a nice time with uh, with Mahan as like this last ride in the series. So I give it a score of seven out of ten. Um, but again, if you if you're wondering whether or not you should spend the money for it, I'm like, it kind of depends on where you felt about book six. If you were okay with that, if you thought that was a good ending, yeah, then I think you're okay. You don't actually have to buy this. I think you'll be satisfied with what you have. Uh, but if you were the kind of person who always buys that DLC content for those RPG games to just to get a little more story, um, even if it changes the way you see the ending of the series, um, then this is probably something you'll want to pick up. There you go. Okay, uh, on to our next review, which is going to be Seven Talent, Dragon Rider's Fury. Um, this is Seven Talent, book one in the series, written by James G. Patton. Um, he's the author of the Office Wars series, also known as, uh, this is not in that same series, but he does call it a Odetech online series, because it's set in the same kind of a multiverse. Remember, uh, part of that series is that um, there's a VR world, like a hub almost, but they're also like separate VR worlds attached to it. Um, so it's very much a multi-universe kind of storytelling opportunity, but the author tries to connect everything in subtle ways that, you know, if you, if you haven't read their stuff, you won't miss, but if you have read his other stuff, it's like, oh, that was a nice nod kind of stuff. Okay. Um, this one is 444 pages, $4.99. It is on Kindle Unlimited, which is always nice. Uh, here's the author's description. Beware the Dragon Rider's Fury. Even the gods fear its justice, the first Dragon Rider. Bo's Journal, March 13th, N167, um, which is a, 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 a time um, code method in the series. Um, kind of gives you a, a way to compare like where this is compared to the Office Wars. Um, continuing on the description, it started with a card in a cafe, an invitation to an exclusive world called Seven Talon, and it only asked one question before I agreed. Do you want to become a dragon rider? It said nothing about guns, magic, or heavy metal. Those were just added incentive. It also said nothing about the secrets, betrayals, and politics of a dragon-run society. Dragons that would rather eat man, or eat me, than listen to what I had to say. Horrible way to win an argument, in my opinion. Nor did it tell me that the biggest enemy I would have to fight was myself. Okay, now the author has a really big note here saying that the main character of this book does not leave this game world, the Seven Talon. If you're curious about the first chapter, Odetech Online um, and Neuroma, Neuroma uh, please read Office Word series. Office Word takes place in the same world, just a different part of Odetech Clan, and follows a different character arc. It provides a lot more information about Neuroma, Odetech, the sectors, um, and he does have Easter eggs in them to reward readers who read everything, which is what I've already said. Um, okay, now I also... There are a few notes that I just want to let you know about before you read this again. The author isn't kidding. Um, if you're expecting anything like Office Wars, if you if you love Jane Patton's um, Office Wars series, and you expect this to be anything like it, it's not. It really isn't. Um, this is more fantasy um, action adventure with dragons and some maybe some flintlock stuff and heavy metal swords, but there's definitely guns. There's guns, um, like real like World War II guns and like frightful guns, but there's also magic. So it's very different from Office War. So don't expect that. Um, also note that in the version that I read, which is like the first one that came out in the first days or so, um, there are an unusual number of spelling and grammar errors and even some like unfinished sentences. Um, we could like, oh, that probably should have been cut on editing or like something was cut out during editing. Um, and it's just something I noticed because most of the other authors of the works were very polished. And this one just, for some reason, just... A few more errors than there are in other his other stories. Um, okay. Having said that, um, I personally would have loved like just a little more connection to the Odetic universe. I know the author says in advance there isn't in the story, um, but I think the introduction would have gone a little smoother and a little more, a little better. Have there just been like a little more 
explanation about the, the, the larger Odetech universe, that it is a virtual reality universe, that the world itself is like the world is not in a great state. And most people spend their time in this virtual reality capsule and in this virtual reality hub where they can go to these different worlds um, because that's not fully fleshed out in the story, at least in the, in the introduction. Um, there's also not explanation about the technology in the pods that allows for, um, for and this is not too spoilery because the author said I could say it, um, the healing of... Um, sicknesses and illnesses and almost keeping humans alive indefinitely uh, almost a, a kind of immortality um, that is not explained at all in this book whatsoever um, there is like a, a paragraph for what the top, top on a little bit but i would have loved to see just a little more of that just like a paragraph or something uh just so some of the other like tech points in the story would have made more sense okay um generally though um this is a good series like um if you've, if you've read the other books, if you read the author stories, you're going to make sense. Um, there are some cool things in the story. I love the magic system. I love the game mechanics and story, and I love the world on a fundamental level. Really, I do. Uh, this is a this is a very like the author does really great detail work as far as that like, game mechanics making sense and making them cool. He um, the 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 world itself reminds me a lot of um, what's the name of that series? Nomi Novak's uh, Temerary series that combines. Um, dragons and flintlock, except that in this case, they're, they're, they're more modern um, weapons. And it also includes like magic. But if you love those kind of series like Dragon Riders, um, the, the the Riders of Pern, the Dragon Riders of Pern, that, that kind of stuff, if you're into those series, this is probably going to be another favorite for you. Just right off the, just because it has dragons. I mean, it's hard to get over the enjoyment of, of riding dragons. Um, there's also some other cool stuff, of course, including. Um, the I, I like the beginning of the story. The beginning of the story starts the main character off in a starter zone where the players or champions are tested to see who they are and and how they go through a series of tests that determine who they are, what they like, and how that actually affects their stats in the game. So like the choices they make in the starter zone, whether the good choices, bad choices, clever choices, whatever the case is, um, it actually affects their stats. And I thought that was kind of a cool way of, of, of finishing off your character creation. Some of it is is determined like, oh, I want this particular stat or this magic skill, or I choose this race that has the bonuses. But some of it is beyond your um, conscious control. Like the game determines, oh, you're particularly clever or you're good at shooting uh, because of reactions have shown this. And so you get these bonuses. So like, okay, that's a really cool game mechanic, which is again, one of the things I love about the this particular novel. Um, it was kind of a disappointing that some of the antagonists in this beginner zone kind of disappear after the main character leaves it. Um, I would have loved to have seen them kind of get their comeuppance um, in this story because they really weren't nice people and they really weren't likable. Um, but from the author, from what the author has told me, we've had a little bit about the, the review. Uh, he says they're going to come back in later books and they're going to get what they deserve in a way. Um, now, much of the story after the testing of the island, um, again, just reminds me of Naomi, uh, Naomi Nomek's Tamir series. It combines dragon riding and guns, which is great, and heavy metal, um, which is you know great for some people. I'm not as into heavy metal, but I can appreciate the love of uh, of, of a musical genre like that. Um, magic is a really big thing in the world, and again, it's 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 complicated enough to remain interesting, but it's relatively simple enough to understand, um, even if you're like into RPG or magic systems. But again, the series as, as a whole, sorry, the novel as a whole, really does veer more towards fantasy as opposed to what Office Wars was. It veered towards more like modern um, world gaming and like um, tournament kind of stuff. Um, so this is, again, a very different kind of novel. Um, there are threats from evil forces in this novel, and it creates some great excuses for fighting some very unusual monsters. So um, good stuff in there. Now, um, those are the things I liked about the story. Um, and again, I really do love the world that this is based in. It's it's super detailed, like to, on that respect. Um, but my enjoyment level of the novel was dropped um, because of some things. Um, the main character in in the novel, uh, her name is Bo. She's tough. She's stubborn, and she's very grating sometimes, and she's aggressive and and very angry. Um, and these attributes were normally part of a character development arc where the main character becomes a bit softer, you know, through trials or after some vulnerability is shown um, over the course of the story, kind of balancing out the personality of it. Um, and, you know, the jerk with the heart of gold. Um, or another example, this would be like the, um, what's his name? Clint Eastwood kind of character where 
Um, Clint Eastwood's characters are always strong and they're gruff and he, they're sometimes just jerks. Um, and they're very unlikable at the beginning, but then somewhere along the storyline, you get to see another side of that character and some vulnerability. And you see that he's really, uh, uh, has a heart of gold in some respect, or at least he's a little more empathetic. And so you can care about the character a little more. And for me, that just didn't happen with the story, or at least with this character, at least from the, the viewpoint that I, I read about, and I'll get to that. Um, qualifier in a second. Um, there are there's one place in the story um, about the middle where the main character does kind of have an emotional breakdown and she cries. Um, but outside of that one instance, there is no more vulnerability shown um, for her character. Uh, and it was just kind of unfortunate because it makes the character much harder to to like and enjoy. And that was kind of the thing. I kept wanting her to like the character, but she gave me very few reasons to do so besides being just like badass. Um, she would often, though, just be very stubborn and angry for no reason and lash out at people. And um, I mean, it's just a, it's a character choice. Um, let's see. Uh, now, the author, again, messaged me about the review when he read it on Amazon and he uh, he he mentioned something that I mentioned in the review in what the written form of this review. I mentioned that um, the main character has multiple sclerosis, and it's something that comes up repeatedly in the story as like oh something she talks about in the past terms, as like um, in the real world she has multiple sclerosis and she doesn't want to return to her body, so she spends all her time in the game world, and in this particular world she feels you know strong and free, but also still angry because she knows. She keeps referring to getting it. If she goes back, she'll feel like she's trapped in her broken body. Um, and I thought that that might have been a great opportunity to to show that vulnerable, or at least that other side of like why she feels angry all the time. Um, except that we never see it. We're told about it a little bit. Um, you know, her there are a few sequences when she's like recalling past memories. Um, and her, her issues with that and like the doctor's telling her that, you know, she's not going to be able to walk again. Her father's, you know, reaction to it and their relationship and that kind of stuff. Um, but we're never shown what it actually feels like for her to be in that condition in the word world. Because the, the story, again, never actually leaves the game world. It, she, it sends her there and she's there the entire series, apparently, according to the author. Uh, now, the author mentioned that there's a really good reason why we don't he doesn't show her having MS is because she doesn't have it anymore. Um, according to him, there was a there's a paragraph in the story that says that her MS is cured because of the pods. And again, that's not something we necessarily connect if you haven't read the other series, um, which which totally, I'm like, oh yeah, that's right, that, that does do that. And, and he showed me the, in text, like, oh, that's right. There's like a, basically a couple sentences that say in there that she, uh, it's she's cured, but she never wants to go back to that body just in case it's not true. Um, and, you know, he, he, he mentioned, the author mentioned me that he, he did that so that the character would have a sense of a, of, of a victim mentality because she, she, she doesn't know if she's really, really cured or not. She, and she's lived her life for quite a while with that particular condition. Like, and like he kind of mentioned that, Oh, maybe I have just like first impression bias. And that didn't really affect my ultimate uh, review of the, of the novel, but I wanted to make sure you guys knew the author's response to that particular um, review point for me, at least. Okay. Um, but again, I, it, the main character is strong, but she's kind of rock hard in my opinion. Um, so she's strong and gruff, but again, she doesn't have that, that side or that, those moments of vulnerability and her, her character doesn't soften. And the, the author mentioned that her character is not going to soften. It's only going to get worse and she's going to do some really bad things in, in forward in the series. So it's just going to be a thing. Um, hopefully when I read book two, um, this new information will help me understand the character better. But for now, it's just that relationship with the main character um, just was part of the reason why I didn't enjoy the novel quite as much as I, I think I could have. Right? Because again, I love the game where it's just like the main character. It was hard for me to empathize with because she was so mean and she was so gruff and she was just so, to me, just kind of unlikable. Um, so that's what it is. Now, another point that I, I want to mention that just kind of brought it down for me was her relationship with her dragon, um, Malonite. The, the relationship feels very forced. Um, in the story, there are things that happen that are akin to a magical invasion, or even for some people, like a magical version of, of rape. Uh, at least it's not a physical version of it. It's like a, a bonding experience, but it's forced on her. Um, and that kind of situation to me 
seem very traumatic. Um, and yet the relationship between those two characters, between the dragon and her, um, later on in the, in the, in the novel, just is kind of like, Oh, she forgives him. Like, Oh, well, I, I don't really blame you. And I felt like it was, it was something that should have been a little harder. Um, and, and maybe that's just my opinion, but I, it felt like it was a kind of a forced characteristic to justify something that the dragon does later on uh, as kind of a, a redemptive, a redemptive act. Um, and so for me, it's like, because it felt forced, because I didn't feel like it was natural, especially for a character who was so angry all the time, who held such grudges. I was like, okay, this doesn't, this doesn't make sense. It feels kind of forced. Um, so mostly those two things are the things that kind of drop the, the enjoyment level for me just enough so that it's not quite a seven out of 10. Um, overall, the story is fine. A lot of other people are going to really enjoy the story. They're not going to be as picky about these particular just things that bugged me. Um, and, you know, have a really good time. Like this, this is kind of a fun story. The game world, totally love. It's just that there's a few story issues for me that just like, oh, mm, er, and like, I want, I wanted like the story more than I could, unfortunately. So, um, the score I'm going to give it is a six out of 10. Like, so a lot of people will probably ignore it or like, like it more. And like, they can ignore those little, those things. I just couldn't. Uh, so for me, it's score six out of 10. That's seven Talon, um, book one, Dragon Riders Fury with a score of six out of 10. There you go. Okay, on to our next review, which is going to be Respawn Lives 1 through 5, written by Arthur Stone. Um, again, he's the author of the Wittish Noob series. So this is a Russian, another Russian story translated in English. Um, it is uh, 329 pages. It is $5.92. Rather, it's almost double what I would normally pay. Um, it is also not available on Kindle Unlimited. So um, we'll talk about a little bit what, if it's worth your purchase or not. Okay. Um... This is the author's description. You are no one. Level zero. Empty of mind and memory. Even your past has been stripped from your brain by the inscrutable system. A long, difficult road lies between you and remembering any part of who you are. A road punctured with one death after another. You are too puny to survive by might alone. Information is single is the single resource that may keep you alive. But the brainless digis have none of it. Only those with experience can give you what you need, but most are nothing about you. Uh, but most care nothing about you or your plight. In fact, some may mis make it the mission to kill you. So you will die again and again. Your life kind of clicking lower and lower, and even the craters do not know what happened if your counter reaches zero. But many are sure that your last life here is just that. No more response. You are not the first player in the world of sticks, and you will not be the last. You can only hope luck will be on your side. The luckiest players are those who find a vulnerability in the system, those they call cheaters. Perhaps cheating is the only way to win. Enjoy your game. So that's a really long introduction. Um, but it does set up like the beginning part of the novel for the reader. Like that's the, the basic the beginning story. Um, the story starts out with the man with no memory set up, where the main character, who doesn't have a name, um, he wakes up in a dorm room. He doesn't know who he is. He doesn't know how he got there. Um, he doesn't know what's going on. He just complete blank for him. He has he can still talk and he has memories of like history events, math and whatever, but he doesn't know any personal history for himself. Um, he quickly dies fighting a monster, only to respawn in the same place he woke up. Um, while the main character tries to figure out what's happening, he gets some strange messages about stats, levels, XP, and a bunch of other RPG mechanics he doesn't really understand or get. Um, and that's basically what this story is, and that's the beginning. Um, I, I welcome to the story I best describe as a digital apocalypse groundhog day with RPG powers. And that's a lot, that's a mouthful, but I think it fairly describes the beginning. The, the, the constant responding in the beginning of the story is definitely that groundhog day feel. There's RPG powers galore. Um, but a lot of the story is about the main character surviving this kind of digital apocalypse um, and figuring out those rules. At least the first half of that story is basically what this is. Um, it, it, again, he wakes up and he keeps dying and responding, kind of learning each time some of the rules, some of what these some of what these RPG mechanics are, uh, and that's and that and 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 just finding off monsters in in like this apocalypse settings. Um, and again, a lot of the story later on is a lot more about the survival aspects of, of like a post-apocalyptic world. Um, but he also meets other people like him who are, I don't want to say players because that's not the word they use. They call them, I think, um, immunes. I um, mean, they call the people who are uh, turning into monsters, um, digis as like base characters. And then eventually they get infected and they become these different monsters, including like, zombie characters and then other like worse monsters. Um, and they call them, I think, the infected. Um, 
And the first half of the novel really is about the main character just figuring things out and figuring out the game rules and trying not to die quite as much. Um, and, and just like getting little hints from the system about, oh, little mechanics here and there. And part of the enjoyment I had with the first half of the story was just going along with the main character and guessing what these mechanics were or like seeing these hints and knowing myself, oh, that means this RPG mechanic. And but him as a character being like, I don't know games. What the heck is this? Um, and he does again meet other characters who like himself that give him little hints and gifts here and there because even though it's new for him, like they've been respawning for like five or six or seven levels and they've, they've gained levels as, as, you know, as they progress. And so there are different levels of characters with different guns and who have more experience about it. But every time the main character dies, the whole, um, system, the whole area is reset again. And so it always starts out with him in his bed and then he, and then gradually things just kind of go to, to heck in a handbasket. Um, so it's, it's a very interesting kind of mesh there in the first half. Now the second half is a little more, um, predictable and the fact that it's more about like him meeting another survivor or woman who kind of shows him the ropes and explains a lot of the mechanics to him. Um, and then it's their relationship, um, and just dealing with other players or rather, um, other characters who are like him only they're evil and they hurt other people like them because they, they, they're like, they're like, it's like player versus player and that they don't mind hurting other people. Um, and, and, and there's a whole storyline there for that. Um, the novels, again, like this weird mix of, um, apocalypse survival, monster killing RPG progression. And it's not going to be for everybody. If you're not into like, um, survival apocalypse stories, you're probably not going to like this. Um, it's just, you either, either you enjoy that kind of stuff or you don't. Um, and, but it, it does again, mix in, RPG mechanics and like um, and this is a little spoiler as far as the mechanics go, but like things like keeping yourself well fed. Like there's a a, a bar like that has to be satisfied. The same thing with drink or with pleasure or with you know your health or with like there's a special like drink they have to drink to make sure that they continue to like heal rapidly and like you know and, and increase their powers kind of stuff. And there's a bunch of that kind of things here. So a lot of game mechanics in here, um, but it's also combining some other kind of genre kind of stuff. And it's a, it's a nice, interesting mix if you're into that kind of stuff. If you're not, it's not going to work for you. Uh, but for me, I like all those things. I like apocalypse survival stories. I'm into like zombie apocalypse stories. And of course I love Liberty G. So, you know, it's a nice little mix for me. It's also a nice break from fantasy stories because a lot of the stuff, especially this week, um, I think everything else is, is a fantasy Liberty G. And so the fact that this one uh, wasn't, was a nice break from all that, at least for me. Uh, so for me, you get a score of seven out of 10. That's respawn lives one through five, uh, with a score of seven out of 10. Okay. Uh, on to our next story. There we go. Um, it is written by S.W. Clark, um, Sakura Online, uh, Book Zero, of The Ringer. Okay. Uh, this one is 149 pages. It is $2.99. Um, it is available on Kindle Limited. And you know what? Let me check real quick. I think the author said she was going to change the price talk on that to $0.99. Cents. Uh, and nope, oh, nope, still same price. Never mind. She did not change that. Um, but price point wise, it's a little expensive. It's about, again, double what I would normally pay. Uh, I would say it's not really worth the price tag as a purchase. Um, you may enjoy it as a Kindle Unlimited read though. That's, that's something you'll have to determine for yourself. Um, I'll get into my, my review though. Um, after I read the author's description, of course, uh, the author's description, uh, what do you do when the game is too tough? Why? Of course you will bring in a ringer and I lost my place. Darn you. Okay. Um, on his first night as a beta tester for Sakura Online, 21-year-old Galen Cole meets the clone Prairie Ringer Powell. She isn't, he isn't sure what to make of Prairie. She's engineered for violence, a man show with the bow, and a rural wild card. But they need each other. Galen and Prairie are two of the first batch of testers for the game that has a tendency to stomp on its players. Fresh from debugging, Sakura Online is an ever-shifting world whose AI has been programmed to alter its level based on the personalities inside. But Sakura needs to feed before she can blossom into an MMORPG. She must learn human behavior, motivations, and reactions to setbacks. Enter the level crawl. 10 days, 10 unpredictable worlds, and if Galen survives, he'll be granted his heart's desire, a lifetime of free access to Sakura Online, but first he has to survive. So there you go. That's the author's description. Okay. Um, my view basically at first, the first thing I noticed is that the person on that cover is like a lady, is a girl. So you would think that the main character of the story is a woman, and it's not. It's a dude. Um, so first off, I think that's just um, that gives readers a, a different expectation of when they're reading. Um, the main character, who is a guy, Galen, uh, 
he is uh, one of 24 testers in this new full immersion game called Sakura. They're supposed to test the game in some way, and if they make it through all 10 levels, they win a lifetime subscription. Basic, right? Um, except that the premise is a little thin, uh, for me at least, and is very kind of poorly described. Um, there are no directions about what the testers are supposed to be testing, um, and what it takes for them to beat a level. And each level is is very different from the next one. Um, and they basically get in in the first level, they get, I think it's a uh, three lives um, before they're kicked out of the entire project. And then after that, if they die at all, second level, three level players, they're kicked out the project entirely. Um, and and that's not exactly said in the beginning of the story. It's something you discover as you as you continue on. Um, essentially, the the characters and the main character in particular is just dropped off somewhere in the level, and there's like figure it out. Uh, they're not given direction. They're not given goals or guidelines. And it's just, oh, go go figure some stuff. Um, so it's, it's like I said, the premise is a little ambiguous. And maybe that's the author's intention, like creating an open world kind of vibe to it. Um, but it, it's like, okay. Now, the early part of the story in the first level um, describes, oh, actually, before he even gets into the game, he describe, describes the main character's infatuation with the clone Prairie. Um who I can only assume is the lady on the cover. I'm, I'm pretty sure she is. Um, she partners with him for no real reason. Just that, oh, this is how the story goes. Um, so there you go. By the 8% mark in the story, the main character is dropped in the game world and he finds himself meeting magical creatures and helping them to stop the bad guys from killing them. Um, I don't want to spoil details in case you actually want to read the story. Um, but along the way, he meets he finds Prairie, who was dropped off somewhere else, and she joins his party. Now, this is part of the story is where the main character um, and the reader get most of the information about the RPG mechanics in the story, like the describe things like character sheets, stats, health, mana bars, item descriptions, skill descriptions, all that stuff. It's um, it's not special, but it's not bad either. It's it's, it's detailed and it is it follows it falls through the entire story. Um, but this is where you, this is the section where you get most of that information and where it appears the most. Um, now, even though you do get all this information, um, Oftentimes, the the information you're giving kind of doesn't seem like it means much when it conflicts with what where the author wants the story to go. Um, and I'll give you a, a particular example. At one point in the story, an NPC centaur one shot kills like five players with a bow and arrow, um, even though just like a few like a few paragraphs prior to he was really struggling to kill the main character who is a level one character and 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 basically doesn't have any gear um and he yet this same centaur um just murders five other players without any real trouble like he literally just you know um and so just just like that one scene kind of notified me very quickly that oh these rules don't really matter if the story says something has to happen or the, the, the story has to go in a bigger place. Like, it, and that's always a, a balancing act for a little bit of author because many authors are really like, I'm story first, no matter what. Um, and that, that works well when you don't have a system of rules that may contradict it. And people are going to check your math uh, or check like the game logic at least so that those kind of, you know, rule logics um, in, and this is maybe just a personal opinion, a lot of times uh, uh, the more successful little bitty stories, their story is at least partially dictated by what is allowed within the game rules that they've established. And when those game rules seem to be ignored for whatever you know reason, whether it's story or just you don't want the main character to die or whatever it is, readers notice. Uh, and it almost feels like you're, you're, you're breaking the, your, the rules that you established. And that's kind of what happens when the story, when it's convenient. Other times, it, the game rules are very much followed. Um, it's, it's really just like one of those things that just kind of bothers me. And I know it bothers a lot of other readers when it feels like, oh, you put game rules in there, but if you're not going to follow them, what's kind of the point? You, you know what I mean? Um, the entire scene uh, section in this first level is very fantasy game world. Um, and another thing that kind of happens in this first section is that there's just like this really abrupt time shift. Like one moment, the main character is like, oh, I got to go save this girl. You guys going to come with me? And they're like, yeah, let's go. And then bam, they're tied up and they're getting, and they're just dying. And there's no, nothing in the middle. It's literally, let's go do this. And then pff, next sentence, we're all tied up and we're bleeding to death. And then bam, the level ends. I'm like, and it's just I'm like just storytelling wise, it it was just a very abrupt shift for absolutely no reason. I, and maybe it's just the author like, oh, this is a short story. I don't want to spend too much time in this level. I have other things to write. That's fine. It's just that those kind of um, 
storytelling jumps it just bugged me because I'm like, what, wait, wait, what do we, what's happening between here and here? Like, Ugh. um, so that, and that happens, um, in just about every level that you, that you experience in this particular novel. And again, it's a short story. So the author, of course, wants to keep a particular word count, keep it short because she has a whole another novel to write, uh, the first book in the series. So I, I kind of get that. It's just that reading it, it's, it's just, it, it, it bugs me. Okay. Um, now after that first, um, level, um, the main character is pulled out of the game he, because somebody else beats the level, which is never explained how or why it's again, one of those just like kind of plot holes is like, Oh, it happens. Okay. Um, and after the 30%, 33% mark of, this, of the novel, a, the novel kind of ceases to be lit RPG, um, in a lot of ways. Uh, instead it be, kind of becomes this poorly executed attempt at creating a virtual reality version of Westworld, at least to me. Um, the NPCs, in these various levels are recycled. And so you see them being killed again and again and again by players, by, um, by, by, uh, by each other. Um, but like the main, the characters, the main character and his groups on level one, oh, you see them again in level two and then level three, and they're being murdered again and again and again, except that in each one of these levels, it's a different scenario or, or it's a different condition. For example, in the first level, fantasy, it's like a, it's a prairie. It's a, it's a, it's a fantasy, uh, magical fantasy world, right? Level two, uh, it's the Wild West. So even then, like that's a little, that's a little close to what Westworld was. Um, and then in level three, it is a um, a modern world setting in the year 21, uh, 2102. So it's a slightly in the future. But again, there are like just modern guns and trolleys, and it's a big city, and there's explosives galore um, kind of system. So it's it's a more modern setting, and it's just like this inconsistency between those worlds that. I guess bothers me as as a as a reader and as a as a as somebody who really appreciates um, the consistency of a, of an RPG world because each one of those worlds works very different. Like the the goals are different, the way combat works is different, yet the characters um, character system is kind of static and it's the same no matter what world it inhabits. I'm like, so that feels like you're you're changing the rules again um, without always telling the reader how those rules change necessarily. Um, so again, it's, and it's just one of those things like, and again, starting in the second world outside of the character sheets updates and the distribution of like those stat points that the author does again in, in the beginning of each, each one of those worlds. Um, a lot of the RPG mechanics actually just disappear. Like I said, most of the, what you're going to see is in that first level, but in, in levels two and three and in the, in the old West and in like the modern modern world, um, you just see a lot fewer, like you see occasional descriptions or losses of health during combat. Um, it's just, even those things just kind of appear less. Um, and again, the game mechanics just feel like they don't matter to the story or like they were like the story was written in advance. And then afterwards the author went back and then like, Oh, this is a damage notification should go here. Or like an item description can go here because the main character gets a gun or whatever. But it, it's a lot of it, it feels unacknowledged in the actual story. So it's like, Oh, between paragraphs, you know, put up a few entries and there's an item description that should satisfy those folks. Um, and I mean, I'm not saying that's the author's intent or that's what she actually did, but because the game mechanics don't always like, feel like they impact the actual story. Um, that's kind of how I felt about them. Um, so I get, I like kind of like the stuff that happened the first 30%. It's, it's fairly detailed. And again, the mechanics like they matter a little bit more, um, more <laughs> than the rest of the story, I should say. Um, and it had potential to be very interesting, but again, after that, it kind of loses me because it feels less like a literary story and just more like a virtual reality simulation that kind of mimics Westworld. And maybe that works for some people, but it, as a lit RPG story, it didn't really work for me, unfortunately. Um, it, it had the game mechanics continued after in the same manner they, they did previously, um, or if, had I felt like they mattered more in the story and they weren't just there like, um, they didn't feel like they were just inserted in post, uh, it would have a better score. But again, even with that, like the shifting rules and the time frames and like the skip, just like the sudden skips in story, um, really would have been a big issue for me as it is. I didn't like the story. Um, I, it wasn't like, and it wasn't just not entertaining. Uh, it just, I actually didn't like it because of those, those things just bothered me so much. And I, I'm like, and it is what it is. I give it a score of four to 10. Um, there you go. Uh, that's Sakura online, the ringer, a little bit story. Um, I actively didn't enjoy it, uh, very much. Uh, uh, so gets a score of 10. There we go. Okay. Uh, next story. 
This one is Tom Han- written by Tom Hansen. It is a lore's beginning. Um, a Lodipurgy Gimlet epic entered the Lover E. Um, it's a to plan of words in the story that you'll. It's a joke. It's an anti joke. Okay, this one is 491 pages. It is $5.99 since it is available on Kindle Unlimited. Okay, I'll read you the author's description. One life, stolen memories. Gaming has consequences when the AI won't let you leave. In the battle to save his race, Scarhoof is the last guard standing. If the old shaman fails to protect Sunset Cove, the defenseless minotaurs in his care will fall into the enemy's scaly clutches. But on the other side of the VR console, Far more than Scarhoof's game role is at stake. Adriana and her team of programmers are in for some long nights on the job. Epoch International's latest immersive game wasn't supposed to be released for months, but the AI had other plans. Now it's trapped players in the simulation and holds their memories hostage. If Adriana can't hack her way in, Scarhoof and the other players could be lost for forever. So, excuse me. There you go. Okay, now basically this are there are two stories in this in this novel. Um, they don't ever cross like some of the information you will get from the first story um kind of reveals some some potential um details in, in the second story but they really don't ever cross like they one's in the real world one is in the game world and they don't ever like the characters from the first story aren't in the second and the second aren't in the first so they're very separate uh and the author says he did this on purpose and there's there's some there's a reason why apparently to him uh i mean should say to him Okay, uh, the first story is a thriller about artificial intelligence that was created by a game company to create the next generation of full immersion virtual reality. Um, the AI takes over the game company and launches their planned game ahead of schedule. This story is about the game company trying to spin the launch, and um, so it makes it seem like they did it on purpose, and so they don't lose investors or get lawsuits. Um, and the game company just kind of learning about how much control the artificial intelligence has over the game. Um, even going so far as trapping players and wiping their minds. Um, this is roughly 8% of the overall story. And I'll say up front, I like this part the best. Like this part is is quite interesting. It's it's almost this um, techno thriller aspect and it's really high energy and it's really, it has a good pace to it. Um, and it's really, it, it's interesting. It never, it never gets boring, at least for me. Um, but again, it's also only 8% of the story. The other 92% is set in the second game. It's set in the game role, um, which is generally a good thing for a little bit of story. Um, and, and this, and the second, and the second story in this novel is again, takes entirely in the game role that the artificial intelligence launched. It's told from the perspective of a player whose mind has been wiped and whose memories have been placed with game backstory. He thinks he's lived his entire life in this world as a, we'll say minotaur just for, like the author says, uses a different word. Um, he has, you know, the, his own word for the minotaur race. Um, but he thinks he's lived his entire life as a minotaur, including backstory, history, he had time in a war, PTSD, a bunch of other things. Um, and he's now becoming a shaman. He goes on adventures, quests, fights some pretty neat battles later in the story. Uh, but that's what that second story is. And again, it doesn't intersect with the first story at all. When you're in the game world, you're in the game world. This is the sky story. When you're in the real world, it's that other techno thriller thing. Um, now, the concept with the second story isn't bad. It really isn't. Um, it's actually quite interesting. Like, oh, it, it's like the author thought, oh, what if you told the story of an NPC except make him a player because his memory's wiped. And I think that has some very interesting potential storylines because if the artificial intelligence is essentially determining this guy's memory, um, it becomes like a struggle like, oh, how does he get it back? What happens when he starts to get clues? Does that change his behavior? Can he still struggle against the artificial intelligence? And so that, it's a really cool potentiality there for, for like some cool stuff. Um, but the actual execution in, in this particular story, in this novel, isn't as neat, unfortunately. Um, and it, it's kind of a confluence of a couple different things in 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 the story. Um, one one part of this is that the author does a really good job of like world building. Like he creates backstory for the world, for the game world. Um, he creates um, backstory for the main character. Um, like like the main character has a fully fleshed out history that he remembers as his own, including like having to fought in a war, having injuries that ache, um, relationships with with um, the the villagers and, and, and in particular characters, like he has memories of these backstories, um, and the world at large, like the, the, his tribe has cultural customs. Um, the larger world, when he gets to it has, has its own history and those interaction between the races. And it's all really fully fleshed out. Um, but because the main character essentially believes he's, he's a part of it, 
the story is being told from his perspective, almost as if it's just a fantasy story. Um, there is very little acknowledgement that this is actually a game world. Um, and, and, and that's unfortunate because it, it, it almost feels like I'll say torn, um, fan fiction from world of Warcraft. Like the torn race is a, is a miniature race from world of Warcraft. Um, and a lot of what this feels like is it only if it was written as a straight fantasy story. Um, and that's mostly because the game notification story feel like they're inserted in post. And that's always an issue because it's very hard to make the game world feel integral to your story if you're filling in those notifications and if you're filling in those game mechanics after you've written the main story. Um, and, and, and that's kind of what this feels like. Um, it feels like the author intends to write a, a little bit of story and, and uh, the game mechanics that are there, they're flushed out, they're detailed, they're, they're, you know, they're nice, but they're inserted in the story in such a way that it almost feels like, Oh, the main character's action adventure. He's doing the thing. He's a, you know, he's hoeing a field. Then there's a notification and he doesn't acknowledge it exists at all. Like the reader sees it. There's the implication that the player sees it or the character sees, it, I should say. Um, but then he doesn't acknowledge it. So it's like, Oh, then he just goes on his merry way or he does some other thing. And that, that's what I'm talking about when I say like, it feels like it's inserted in post in, in you know, after the actual story is already finished. And that's just kind of the vibe that I got. I'm not saying that the author didn't make the effort to, to write a full RPG system. It kind of feels like he did. It's just that a lot of the story, at least in the very beginning, uh, especially, it feels like those mechanics and those notifications were just kind of entered in after the story was already done. Um, and like Alexa, also because of all that world building, <laughs> but it's told from the perspective of somebody who lives in this world. Again, it feels like almost like a fantasy story. Um, so there you go. But, um, the author, again, makes a great bit of effort. He, like, he really does a good job of creating that history and culture. But again, that also just feel, feeds into this feeling like a fantasy story. Because you know, there is very little cultural acknowledgement of those RPG mechanics. I'm like, oh, so that's, you know, that is unfortunate. Because like, the writing is really solid. The writing's solid, and it's well done. And it's just like, oh, it's just not really RPG-ish a lot of times. Um, it is what it is. Um, overall, I like the first story better. And that's not a good sign in a literary story when you like the part that is not in the game world. Um, the second didn't really work for me. And again, a lot. some of this is just that the first part of that game world story is kind of boring. Um, the, the It picks up later on. I'm not saying it's boring the entire time. Uh, but the very beginning of that is just... A lot of fetch quests, game flower, uh, picking flowers, collecting items, talking to so and so uh, to advance your class or whatever. To advance your well, they don't even say advance your class, like advance your training as a shaman now. Um, you know that kind of stuff. Um, and again, later on in the story, in the game world story, at least um, things get more focused, they get more action driven, and some of the fights at the very end of this are really pretty cool. It's just that a lot of that doesn't happen until after the fifty percent mark of the story, and a lot of people just aren't going to stick around that long. Like, like I, I genuinely like the werewolf storyline. It's good. It, it pops in and out though. But like 92% of this is just like, it feels like a fantasy story. And the author again, this is the case. Of like when I, when I post these reviews early on Amazon before the podcast of uh, sometimes the author is like right back and they're like, Hey, how's it going, dude? Uh, but the author, Tom Hansen was very nice about, um, about this, uh, and I totally just lost what he had written. Um, but he was, he was nice, but he didn't want me to point out a few things about his particular story that he didn't think that I either noticed or, you know, was about. Uh, one, he wanted me to mention that the character Scarhoof does have some depth character. <laughs> he really does. He has anxiety, he has PTSD, he has survivor's guilt, and the main character and the author try to emphasize those aspects of his personality. Um, but at the same time, those aspects of his personality and this is me talking, not, not the author anymore, those are artificial constructs created by the AI in his memory. So it, it, it has, it, to me, it lessens the impact a little bit, but like I said, the character depth of these characters is nice, it, but it also feels, but it's also written as like a, almost a fantasy story. And the author kind of acknowledges this in, in, in the message that he wrote me. He's like, I wrote this more as, I did write this more as an epic fantasy than fantasy adventure. And like, yeah, that's totally true. He, he That's kind of what this feels like. Um, and I'm not saying that it's not literally because they're getting the mechanics are there. They encoded levels. There are, um, 
they're not like fully described experience points, but but there's a system in place that advances the character and, and his abilities and his power structure and his shamastic abilities and his and his you know his his spells and stuff. Um, but again, it it really it felt more like fantasy with like some stuff kind of put in in post uh, as far as like RPG mechanics go. And for some people, that's going to be great. Like some people really don't like. Um, like a super gamey kind of story for me. I love that kind of story. And there are things I liked about the story. It's just that though, that kind of lack of meaning for the game mechanics, or like at least their acknowledgement in a lot of places, um, just drew it down a little bit for me. So it gets a score six out of 10 for me again, not bad, not even boring. Um, it's just not good for me at least, but some of the people will enjoy it quite a bit. I think, um, it scores six out of 10. Um, for a lower's beginning, a lit RPG game lit epic. Um, enter the Little River book one. Oh, and I want to mention there are some really funny AI jokes and Jurassic Park jokes from like that first rural storyline. Just saying, because the author made me laugh a couple times. Um, but that's a score skin score six out of ten for this particular novel. There you go. Okay, um, number six out of seven. Here we go. Rogue Online, The Devil's Gate, a little bit adventure, The Rogue Land Chronicle Book One, written by E.K. Baxter and M.E. Uh, Gal- Gal- Galarvi. I think that's it. Okay. Uh, 198 pages, uh, $3.99. It is available on Kino Limited. Okay. This one is. Uh, okay. Here's the author's description. To survive, you must win. Nothing else matters. Max is a top-level gamer and a battle mage with enough power power to level a city or a small village at least. Lots of people want to want to want to be him. A few want to kill him, but most just want to kill him. At least in the game, things in real life ain't so easy. Um, after double crossing the all-powerful corporation, the shadowy tech company that runs the world's biggest gaming tournaments, Max find himself, finds himself on the run. His only chance to escape is to enter the world of Rogue Online, a prototype full immersion game that just might let him evade his enemies. But soon he soon discovers that Rogue Online isn't the safe haven he'd hoped, especially when he's been stripped of all his abilities he's worked so hard to build. If he wants to get home, Max must use all of his skills and ingenuity to level up and cover the dark conspiracy at the heart of the corporation, the conspiracy that threatens not only Rogue Online, but all of humanity as well. So there you go. Okay, uh, now that all that description right there from the author's um, author's description of the novel, that's the first ten percent of this thing, um, or the first like ten fifteen. It's not it. Most of this is in this game world, and I'll, and I'll describe it. Um, the first ten percent of the story is the best part of the novel. It recounts a big raid fight led by the main character Max um, against the re- reigning champ Nightshade. Anyone that's played an MO will find this section well described and relatable. And it's, I don't think it's an accident. I mean, that's the sample size, so, so you want it to be really good. Um, now, after that, the story becomes RPG portal fiction. Max is supposed to throw the match. Uh, in the MMO, and when he doesn't, he's chased down by the people who want to kill him, the corporation. Um, he meets a mysterious stranger that offers to help him escape by sending him to a new world where he can be the chosen one. That's literally what it says, ladies and gentlemen. He, he offers him the chance to be the chosen one. Uh, Max agrees, and he's sent to the Rogue Lands, also called Rogue Online for some reason. Like, there's a conflict. Like, the names are interchangeable for some reason. Um, unfortunately, this is where the story falls apart. In this new world governed by RPG mechanics, Max finds a bunch of familiar RPG stuff. Um, a character sheet, stats, mana, etc., the whole thing. Um, there's a lot of text devoted to the description of how the game mechanics work. Um, but those game mechanics really don't matter. Um, additionally, the story itself falls very much on the rails in that the main character is kind of led from one situation to another. Um, and he doesn't really make very many decisions the entire novel. So it's kind of a letdown that way as well. Now, um, details on the game mechanics... Um, in any lit RPG, any RPG, Miller B story, the RPG mechanics should feel like they're an important part of the story that affects the world. And even though there's a lot of like numbers and character sheets and stats and stuff and quest description and modifications throughout the entire novel, the mechanics don't really feel meaningful. Um, and again, this is one of those things like that always kind of bugs me a little bit. Um, a good example of this is how health is treated in the story. Even though there were actual stat numbers used in the character sheets, health is represented in the entire novel as percentages. Um, there's no reference point to what the percentages are. Like There's no saying, oh, okay, oh, a character's health is 100 points or 500 points. It's just, oh, he, I lost 10% of my health when this dude hit me. Um, but even in those instances, 
those values don't always make sense. Um, and there's this is an example from the story. Um, at one point in the story, um, the main character is, is attacking a bunch of mercenaries, and he he kills them, one shots them with the bow and arrow. This sounds familiar, um, but he does it with a stat score of like one to three. Like his hell, I forget. I think his strength score is like three, and his other stats are like one, and a few with like three, which is not very good apparently when you compare it to other characters. Um, but later on, when he fights a a, a, a character um, who has a strength of like twenty five, which is literally almost ten times what his is. Um, the main character magically avoids all his attacks, um, or only takes like 10% damage when he's hit. And like, and those, and th that's what I mean by like, oh, you have game mechanics in here and you have numbers, but they don't mean diddly squat because they don't actually impact what's happening in the story. And, um, and that just, that's what happens here. Um, like so there are a lot of other issues with the game mechanics, including like never giving the reader a baseline for what attack damage is. Like there, there are item descriptions of, of weapons saying, oh, plus five to attack and plus 20 to attack or whatever, but they never, the author never really describes what does that mean um, for like damage or your chances of attacking. Uh, it's just something that's kind of skipped over. Um, the stat changes all, all the, the main character because as the character's level, um, you get one stat point to distribute somewhere. Um, but none of those increases in those stats really seem to impact the story at all. Like he's just as weak or he's just, he's just as overly described strong and unbeatable almost, um, no matter what his stats are and no matter how they change in the story. Um, and again, some of the understreams don't make much sense. Um, and so there are just issues. Um, a lot of the RPG mechanics either feel like, oh, the story is written for in a certain way and mechanics are added second again, or um, somebody kind of created an RPG system and just didn't finish it all. Um, and that's just kind of the way it felt, at least to me. Um, like I said, I like the first 10% of this novel. Um, the, the game plan that MMO Raid, it feels like it's based on someone's actual experiences as, as a player. It's very authentic. Um, the premise of the story, um, it's a little flimsy. Like it, and like, oh, you're playing MMO one, one minute and then you're running for your life because you didn't, you didn't, you know, take a fall during a, during a, during a raid that was streamed over the world. So yeah, the corporation wants to kill you. Okay. And then a stranger you just happen to meet opens a magic portal and sends you through it where you're the chosen one in an RPG world. I'm like, okay, that's again, a little thing I've, I've read thinner. Um, but it's not like the best premise. Plus the game world itself, it, the, the story in the game world isn't a hundred percent clear what it actually is. Like I said, there are two titles to this. One is the rogue lands, which very much feels like um, portal fiction and that it's a, a, a fantasy world ruled by RPG mechanics. But at the same time, it's also called um, Rogue Online, um, where it's has some, it's called, I mean, even the community says, oh, it's the most advanced MMO ever. And I'm like, that's, that wasn't not what it's always presented as. I'm like, it's very inconsistent as far as like the world building, which one it's going to be like some characters in the story don't see any of the stuff that the main characters, they don't see levels, they don't see stats, they don't see any of that stuff, but others do. And I'm like, it's it's a very inconsistent thing. And the story itself is also rather inconsistent. Um, and again, like I, my big issue is the fact that the main character doesn't really have agency. He just kind of does what other people tell him and he follows a series of like quests and the, that, that advance the plot. Um, so there you go. Um, worst of all, I don't care about the character. Like I, I really don't. I don't care about the main character. I don't care about anybody in the story because I'm never given a reason to. Like there's very little character development in the story as well. So I'm like, mm, it's hard to like really be interested in. And in when when the story doesn't give you a reason to be interested, it's just stuff that happens to dude. Uh, so that is what it is for me. It wasn't like necessarily bad. It just felt half done, and it wasn't really entertaining for me. Um, so it gets a score of five out of ten. That's Rogue Online, a Devil's the Devil's Gate, a little RPG adventure, the Rogue Lands Chronicle Book One, <laughs> with a score of five out of ten. There you go. Okay, last review. Okay, this one is uh, uh, called The Grind. It's written by Dante Doom. Um, it is five hundred fifty-eight pages, two dollars ninety-nine cents. It is available on Kindle Unlimited. Um, I will read you the author's description. Um, one young woman hungers for status in a harsh, feudal future, but her greed could become her downfall. In the desolate future state of very King Le uh, Leopard and his lords rule with absolute authority, 
There's only one way for the oppressive serfs to rise in rank, the MMORPG called The Grind. Once a year, players in this virtual game can fight for opportunity to raise their standing by gathering as many points as possible. Peasants can become nobles, lords, and with enough skill, sometimes kings. Savannah, or Savvy, DeForge is a grinder, the lowest of the low who earns a living racking up points for players by ghosting them in the game. When a wealthy client named Timon comes calling, she sees him as her ticket out of the classless limbo of grinder life. But when her father vanishes in the game, Savvy will have to choose between the advancement she craves and reclaiming the one she loves. A virtual death starts to become terribly real. Savvy realizes there is much more at stake than status, and it may be too late to save anyone including herself. Now, I think that last little bit there is a little misleading in that very little of the story has anything to do with like her looking for her dad, but we'll get into that. Um, this is from the author Dante Doom. If you've been listening to the podcast for a while, uh, you may recognize him as a name that's been on some other little bit titles. Um, and the author... Uh, presents himself uh, to readers in the Liberty community as a gamer and a Liberty lover who wrote his first novel in two weeks. He self-published and they put out a whole trilogy within a couple of months. Um, yet he probably doesn't actually exist. Um, I heavily suspect that he's a made up person or made up character um, from the uh, publishers really publishing as a gamer author who appeals to readers, um, which I wouldn't really have a too big of a problem with if they were just honest about it. But in all the literature and all the, Amazon author descriptions and in in the novel itself when they describe the author, it's just it's presented as a real person. Um so I think it's disingenuous. And in episode 71 of the podcast, I'll have a link for the show notes, I actually lay out all the evidence that I collected that this is probably the case, including like an actual conversation I had with the author um Dante Doom on Facebook, where I actually just at some point asked him um, if this is the case, because there's uh, again the evidence is, is there, and then the author just stops responding. Um so like I said, go watch that episode. Um, I have a link in the show notes to that exact point for that review. So you don't have to like look through it um, in the show notes if you want to look at that particular part of the story. Now, putting that to the side, um, the review for the novel is a little bit mixed. Um, the novel really starts out great. I, and I mean, wonderfully. Like this is this is a good opening. Um, it, 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 the opening scene captures the reader's attention. It doesn't make a mix of like sarcasm and action, but at the same time does a really good job of describing the game elements that are in this story and in this world. Um, the main character, Savannah, is a grinder, someone in the future in this uh, post-apocalyptic world that's been rebuilt uh, of a society that illegally power levels anyone that can pay for her service. Um, in the society she lives in, if you... Um, Ranks earned in this game, in the grind, determine one's place in their society. So if you well, do well doing your game run and you get enough experience orbs, you can be any level of like character or any levels of a class. Like um, a serf is like the lowest level. You can get to like lords or uh, barons and lords and lords and ladies of the court or something. And then like the king himself, if you if you do well enough. Um, and so it's a very interesting way of of making the game stuff really means something in the real world. And I really actually like that setup. It was really, I was genuinely surprised how much I liked the beginning of the story, which just made my disappointment with the rest of it that much worse. And I was like severely disappointed with how the rest of the story played out. Like at the beginning, I'm like, it's, it's, it's pretty stellar. Like it really is like the setup of the world, the, the, the way that the systems work together. I'm like, wow. And it's like, maybe this is going to be a good one. And I'm like, then I'm like reading the rest. I'm like, Oh, Darn it, it's not. And, and, and like it is. So um as the novel continues, um the main character gets a new client, this noble that needs a good rank in the game to help maintain his family's power at court. It's a way for that to take the reader on like a noob journey. Um and explain more about how the game works and how it matters to society. Unfortunately, it turns into this argument between the about what's how it's great to be noble or how it's not, um, and how the main character wants to be one of the nobles and live, live the good life that she thinks that they live. Um, afterward, the story devolves into this kind of Wizard of Oz kind of story where she, the main character goes through a series of decently described fights and collects a group of magical friends, one of who is a total ripoff of the Tin Man, um, to defeat the evil king before he can take control of the game. Now that on its own, not a horrible plot. It really isn't. It's, it's you know, people like the Wizard of Oz. Um, but... The author also tries to mix in a lot of other ideas and story plots, and the whole thing gets really muddled, 
and very uninteresting as it continues on. Um, the author tries to add plot points about the nobles opposing the king and a, a plot to kill the king. Uh, and then the main character is trying to kill the nobles and then trying to kill the king. And then she's convinced to, or, or forced to try to kill the nobles again and back to the king and, and back and forth several times. Um, and it gets kind of annoying. And then there's also this, it's talked about in the novel description um, about her looking for her father who's been stuck in, um, there is time compression between the game and the world where it's like one year for every day of the real world. And so her dad has been missing for a month in the real world, but in game time, it's like 30 years. Um, and yet the main character doesn't really seem to care as she's trying to like get money to, or, or orbs to increase her, her ranking eventually. Um, and, and that I said, even though it's in the author, uh, description of the story, it's a very minor point. Like the main character really doesn't give a hoot about her dad. Um, but that's still part of the story. And then it shifts again to like the main character trying to reset the whole game world. And then like a political trial and like a test for her to like stop the ki- city from murdering everybody during her battle. And I was like, there's just so many plots and so many just like weird twists and like shifts of focus for the story, that it was super hard to stay interested in it, to be honest and to even finish it. Uh, the game mechanics, while consistently in the game, they don't have a lot of depth. Like, they're there, and they're they're a little innovative. Um, instead of, like, experience points, they collect experience orbs, or something like you would get from, like, Diablo. Um, but those orbs convey rank in the world world and get them in the game, but they don't really have any impact on the gameplay. So, like, the difference between, like, a lord and the main character isn't really described really well. Like, there's... Like most of the advancement in the story, and, and the main character doesn't really advance herself. Um, instead, she just collects orbs. She doesn't change rank. Um, that, that, that's a technicality of the game system. Um, most of the power increases come from like weapons that are kind of purchased or, 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 or looted from like dead enemies, or like the main characters can spend these experience orbs on like purchasing powers from a store that are like slottable. And it's like, it's, but that's kind of it. And besides like there being a health bar, that's all there is to the game stuff. Um, literally that's, that, that's it. Um, so not particularly in depth. Um, overall it was a different, a disappointing read after a really good start. And I think part of the disappointment is like, it was a really good beginning and the rest of it is like, Oh, that sucks. Um, and again, it's mostly due to the unfocused nature of the plot. Um, it just couldn't seem to stick to one storyline or purpose. And it just kept shifting around. I'm like, okay, when is this going to end at some point? Um, so for me, like I said, the beginning is good enough to not give it a bad score, but it just wasn't entertaining. So it gets a score of five out of 10. Um, the grind with the score of five out of 10. There we go. That's it. We are done. We Okay. Um, that's it for it, everybody. Thank you very much for listening, uh, for watching, and thank you authors, uh, the two authors who were nice enough to write responses into the podcast uh, for the review that they saw. Um, I'm always happy to, to to read those responses. I think it's only um, responsible to to give the authors an opportunity to to say something back if that if they choose to. Um, so those like I said, those authors are very nice about the responses. Though they weren't mean, they were just like, oh. You might have missed these points. Um, thank you very much for you know giving us a review though for giving my, my book a review. So they're, they're, they are generally nice guys. Um, if you want to follow us, you can follow us on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube, on Patreon. Um, and if you want to support the podcast in any way, shape, or form, you can find out all the ways to do so at littlepdpodcast.com forward slash slash support. There you go. Um, thank you very much for hanging out with me, uh, for listening to me go on and on about Little RPG and the things that I love about it. Um, I, it is, it's a passion podcast. I, I do this because I love it. And because I, I know you guys as a community love the genre as much as I do. So thanks for hanging out with me. And until we can hang out again, folks, remember to go read some of your, and oh, don't forget, go into those contests, man, win some prizes, uh, help me to celebrate the 100th episode of this podcast. But until we can see you again, go have a good week and read some Little RPG.